welcome to Keep the Bastards Honest, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, we discover that Scott Morrison was bad at a lot more jobs than we thought. Yes, just when we thought it was safe to start a countdown on when there would be a by-election in the seat of Cook, Scott Morrison comes roaring back into the headlines with the single most bizarre episode in Australian politics since John Kerr sacked Gough Whitlam to avoid being sacked by Gough Whitlam. And the reason we discovered that Scott Morrison had himself appointed as a one-man secret government in his own government is because he told a couple of News Corp journalists about it as background for a book they were writing on how his government had managed the first two years of the pandemic, rather than inform his own colleagues and ministers, never mind the Australian public. If you have political whiplash from trying to not only keep up with this story, but to work out the ramifications of Morrison's secret power grab, you're not alone. It's a good bet you'll hear my brain explode in real time during this podcast, as my co-host Steve Beatty and I try to make sense of everything. Steve and I pay our respects to the traditional owners of the lands upon which we recorded this episode and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. Steve, before we get started on our deep dive into all of this, I have something I really need to get off my chest about Scott Morrison and this weird ministry thing that's been happening. What, and I cannot stress this enough, the fuck? Let me give you the slightly longer, uh, <laughs> a slightly longer answer the, um, to that question. That'd be lovely. It's, it's remarkable. So last week, two political journalists from the Murdoch stables were um, touting their new book, Plagued, which looks at the politics or the maneuverings or you know like goings on behind the scenes during the pandemic thus the title plagued as part of the promo release for that story started to emerge that during the early part of the pandemic scott morrison secretly swore himself in as the health minister alongside greg hunt and then as the finance minister alongside matthias corman and ultimately Simon Birmingham. Unbeknownst to Matthias Corman, unbeknownst to Simon Birmingham, but with the knowledge of Greg Hunt and with the knowledge of the Attorney General Christian Porter. They took this plan to the Governor General who agreed and swore Morrison in and it was a secret up until the promos began last week and the proverbial shit hit the fan. That's a brilliant summary. So yes, so for anyone who's not been paying attention, that in a nutshell has what has is what has broken this week. So months after we thought that we were safely dispatched of Morrison and his extraordinary weirdness, no, he's back. No, he's, he's back, back, baby. And it's it's hard to really know where to begin with this because every time you scratch at it, it just reveals more absurdity. Um, I'm I'm reminded of a scene outside the British Parliament um, eight or ten weeks ago at the height of Boris Johnson's sort of farcical exit from British politics and someone was blasting the theme song from Benny Hill outside Parliament as loud as they could, apparently sponsored and at the request of Hugh Grant, um, (laughs) which which may be purely apocryphal, but I love it nonetheless. Anyway... I I keep thinking back to that scene of just that complete absurdity and then more gets revealed and more gets revealed and it just seems to get worse and worse. But let's, let's start with the fact that during the pandemic, we had a lot happening, especially at the beginning. And, and this is sort of part of Morrison's rationale and we can dig into his, you know, 1200 word explanation. And I'll call it an explanation because it really isn't an apology, although explanation has been pretty kind. Rationale, let's call it a rationale. He felt at the time things were moving fast. They were about to enact these emergency powers as part of the Biosecurity Act. It gave enormous power to the health minister and it was felt that that was too much power in the hands of an individual and also placed a great deal of risk 
if something untoward should happen to him, blah, blah, blah. So we need a stand-in for the health minister as a result. So, of course, generous fellow that he is, servant of the community that he is, Scott Morrison put up his hand and said, of course, it should be me. I'll do it. Now, maybe, right? Like maybe. Let's let's just park that one for the moment and go maybe. He spoke to the Attorney General. He spoke to Greg Hunt. They spoke to the Governor General. Everyone agreed that this was a plan they were going to go with. They went ahead and did it and they kept it a secret. And And I think for most people, that's where everything starts to stink. And and people have latched on to the secrecy bit, and, and rightly so, but that's just the tip of the... <sighs> that was last week, though. That was the revelation that came out last week as part of the promo. So enterprising folks around the world asked the question, was, was that it? Was that the only one that he signed up to? Were there more? Because, you know, like if he started down that path, might he not have? Well, yes, is the short answer. And then you get into a, quite a long list of ministries that he did, in fact, sign himself into. So where we are right now is that we're aware of five ministries that he had himself appointed to with the Governor-General, and, and we've seen the little signed administrative orders signed by the Governor-General appointing Scott Morrison to these various ministries. So we started in early March with health, fine. A couple of weeks later, finance. Secretly, without the knowledge of Matthias Corman, a little less fine. The following year, though, in April of 2021, Scott Morrison appoints himself or has himself appointed as the minister in charge of the portfolio of industry, science, energy and resources And I'll come back to this one because this one's a little weird, but that's in April. And then in May, he appoints himself as Minister for Home Affairs and Treasurer. Mm. And again, fails to mention that to Karen Andrews or Josh Frydenberg. And the the Ministries of Science, Industry, Energy, etc. didn't mention it to Keith Pitt, the Resources Minister, and failed to mention it to Christian Porter, who helped him set up this little scheme in the first place. So if you were going to mention it to anybody, you think you might mention it to the guy who gave you the advice as Attorney General that said this is all above board. You might give him a heads up on the 6th of May and say, hey, listen, Christian, I've stepped in. We're now wearing the same shoes, by the way. Pardon the, pardon that visual, folks. But we're now wearing the same shoes. I've got you in case you uh, suddenly bereft of your ability or will to administer your portfolio five in 15 months yeah i'm gonna make a crude joke here but but christian porter at this stage had moved from being the attorney general to being the the Mm -hmm. minister for industry because of his own issues around you know historical accusations of rape Mm -hmm. which just adding to the whole sort of stench of the morrison government in general so the the irony of Porter as AG, giving giving Morrison this this idea, and then twelve months later having his industry portfolio shadowed by Morrison, just in case something happened to Porter, and it's like, well, to be fair, case. something could have happened to Porter. <laughs> something like, kind of had. Yeah, I mean, had, if, indeed. if if you didn't think the guy was up to the job, yet there were plenty of opportunities to keep him out of it. Let's let's be yeah. fair. Yeah. And remember, there was that whole period where. He was, uh, Porter was in the doghouse because of those allegations. Mm. They came out, the million dollar blind trust that he failed to disclose, like all of those sorts of things was right through this period. Mm. And yet he still found himself as the industry minister, a minister for, for industry, until he subsequently resigned. And now we find that Morrison was joint minister without his knowledge through that period. It's so wild. My what the fuck at the start of the podcast was not hyperbolic. Oh. That is no. genuinely how I think. No, no, no. no. Every, everyone from the press gallery to constitutional experts to the current Prime Minister, Albanese, oh. is currently feeling. <laughs> yeah, I've got a. I, I would love to be a fly on the wall listening to Anthony Albanese be briefed on this matter oh. just to see his face. 
Mm. I, I really would. I, I, I'd pay very good money to see Anthony Albanese's face as he was walked through this timeline and these decisions just to see how he would react and was reacting at the time as someone went, and and the then, mm. and, and and the then. And you'd have to be sitting there asking, was that it? Was that the, <laughs> like, are there any more? Yeah. And I, oh, I don't know, I have a feeling we're not there yet. And the reason I say <laughs> that, I like I've got a strong hunch that Scott Morrison was joint minister for education when Alan Tudge was missing. Oh. Um, because there was an awful lot of who's actually the minister here going on in the lead up to the election and the person who was acting in the role seemed unaware of some of the decisions that were being made. That was Stuart Roberts, I think. <gasps> yeah. Was. He seemed kind of vague on well, who actually made this decision around some things at that point and also just the simple fact of, well, who is the education minister? And I think he realised or must have known at that point that actually it's Scott Morrison. <gasps> but whatever you do, don't say that out loud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a secret. Well, his brother Stewie, of course he would have been. Of course he would have known, it, right? Yeah. And at the time, that vagueness on his part, I think everyone put down to the fact that he was not super competent as a minister. Yeah. And not really up yeah. to the job in the first place. So he he, you know. he plays the part of a vague, bumbling politician very, very well. It's a very <laughs> convincing It's a very convincing act on his part. And like you, I share the suspicion that perhaps it's not as much of an act as we might like. (laughs) If it is an act, then he's very committed to his craft, very committed to, you know. Yeah. 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 So let's let's pick up on this. So part of Scott Morrison's defence in all of this was that things were moving quickly There were a lot of moving parts. There were a lot of decisions that needed to be made quickly. Um, They were concerned about the continuity of government, the continuity of decision-making authority, rah, rah, rah. And so this was like a a redundancy measure. Now, you work in technology. Mm -hmm. When you're designing for redundancy, and and let's just sort of park the pun that Scott Morrison being redundant (laughs) is, you know, like uh, a chef's kiss, but... (laughs) You you tend not to concentrate your redundancy in the one spot, right? No. No, the whole point of redundancy and disaster recovery is that the redundant systems are in a different building to your primary system so that if your primary building gets hit by a meteorite, your, redund- your, your secondary systems can keep, pick up where the, the primary ones have <laughs> left off. Yeah, and if you want to spread the load around and make sure that you've got someone who can step in, so, you know, like, well, then, I don't know, like, if... Josh Frydenberg was sworn in alongside Bridget McKenzie. That might make that might make sense. Mm. If Bridget McKenzie was sworn in alongside um, Keith Pitt, that might also make sense. Keep the Nationals thing together. You know, like I can I can see it. So we've got some clear authority. We know that it's unusual. We don't want you to use your, your authority at all. If the need arises, though, we want you in there straight away. Yeah. Now. Forgive me if I um, sound a bit naive, but I was under the impression that this is what we have assistant ministers for. Apparently I'm wrong. (laughs) According to Scott Morrison, that's redundant. Well, and and this this is one of the arguments that people have raised. Like, isn't that why in those large portfolios you have assistant ministers? Isn't that why in a portfolio like industry, science, energy, and resources, you have four ministers in Mm. charge of the different areas of it, and they can quickly step in if need be. And also, the mechanism by which you sign someone up to become a minister, as we've seen, can be done quite quickly. And I say as we've seen, because, you know, like Porter was thrown out as Attorney General, and Michaelia Cash was sworn in the next morning. Like, it's Mm. not, it's not that big a deal and I suspect that it was only the following morning so that we could agree on who it was going to be and and wake the Governor General up up out of bed to sign the paperwork. It's not like it takes several weeks, you know, it's not like holding a referendum, it's just a a little Mm. bit of paperwork and if you're surrounded by competent folks, it should be as simple as tapping one of them on the shoulder and saying, hey, listen, Greg's sick, can you step into the health portfolio? Yeah. No, apparently. No. (laughs) 
<laughs> that and that in itself opens up so many more avenues because you you raised a really good point about in theory you should have other competent people that you can tap on the shoulder theory, and yeah. do the administrative paperwork to get them you know signed up as yeah. a minister. Yeah. So that opens up the the can of worms of and to be unkind to the Morrison government, they were they were not oversupplied with talent in their mm. ministries. Yeah, yeah. So it is a genuine and live question of whether or not they Morrison had competent people that yes. he could rely on. That's and, fair. But, but <laughs> the the answer to that, I guess, the point that I'm trying to um, get to is that it implies that he didn't trust the people that he was working with. That yeah, you know, he either didn't think that they were competent or didn't think they'd be able to do the job or that he couldn't trust them to do the job more, more accurately or, and therefore he need to take over himself. Or in the case of Keith Pitt, it turns out, might make decisions that Morrison didn't like. Yes. This is where it gets a little interesting because the one and only time that Morrison exercised his authority as a joint administrator or a joint minister was essentially to overrule Keith Pitt on PEP 11, which is a petroleum exploration licence located off the coast of New South Wales, which was up for decision in mid-2021 when the Liberals were already getting heat from some of the community-backed independents in places like the, uh, the Northern Beaches in Sydney, Newcastle, further along the coast, and, and Keith Pitt was going to approve this exploration licence just off the coast of New South Wales kind of thing. Um, Scott Morrison uh, went, actually, I have joint decision-making authority on this one. I'm going to make this decision. I think it shouldn't go ahead and I'm going to sign it. <laughs> I'm basically going to do it. All of which came as a bit of a surprise to Keith Pitt because up until that point he wasn't aware that that was the case. Mm. And what was really weird about that PEP 11 decision was that when Morrison announced it, the way he announced it mm. implied that he had overruled Pitt as Prime Minister, yes. not as Joint Resources yes. Minister. And yes. that's the normal way that you do these things, that as Prime Minister you are in theory the ultimate authority in the party room. Mm. And if one of your ministers who has the ability to make these kind of decisions without cabinet oversight because the curious thing about all of these portfolios is that each of them had total power. They were not, they were responsible to cabinet in the sense that as colleagues they had to sure. keep them informed, but mm -hmm. they didn't need cabinet sign off to make decisions like allowing gas exploration off the coast of New South Wales. And in theory, under, under normal governance, Morrison as Prime Minister would have had to negotiate with Pitt in Cabinet and as a Cabinet convinced him to make a different decision. Yeah. Democracy, it's crazy, right? Absolutely, but right. But instead he was kind of like this Dementor that sort of sucked all of Keith Pitt's power up and made the decision <laughs> on his behalf. Nice reference. Nice <laughs> reference. So what's, what's then interesting is that you then go and look at the timing of some of the other things that he signed up. Because whilst Greg Hunt signing himself in as joint health minister at the beginning of a pandemic when there were so many moving parts, following it up with finance when, again, a lot of moving parts, a lot of money being spent at that point, billions of dollars starting to go out the door, okay, maybe. But this was 12 months after that. Mm. So, and it, and it sounds very much like he did it only so that he could overrule that decision on the on the exploration license. Okay, yeah. fast fast forward three weeks, and Karen Andrews, who's the Minister for Home Affairs, makes a reference in the newspaper that she's open to the idea of letting the Muragupan family stay in Australia. It's the fourth of May, and she comes out and says, "Look, I'm 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 open to considering it. It's not no." But, you know, there's a process, but I'm, I'm open to that. Two days later, the paperwork is signed that assigns Scott Morrison authority, joint authority over home affairs without her knowledge. What? Now, ultimately, ultimately she didn't allow it. And, and they've, only, they've only been provided with uh, permanent residency now that Labor's in, in, in government. But the timing is interesting. 
The other bit that happened at the same time, so on the 6th of May, so two days after the thing with Karen Andrews, 6th of May, he also signs himself in as joint treasurer. Now, May might ring some bells when it comes to the federal treasurer because it turns out it was three working days before the federal budget was handed down. So during the final negotiations for the federal budget, where the federal treasurer is driving negotiations around what's going to be in, what's going to be out, how much can we can we spend and the rest of it. Turns out we had two treasurers. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate, and again, I cannot stress this enough. What the fuck, Steve? It's, it's beautiful. Far out. It's, it's freaking insane. And, and, and what, what's sort of blowing my mind right now, is, as you can, everyone can clearly hear, is Josh Frydenberg... I think spent a good deal of 2021 bunking in with Morrison at the lodge. It was during that period. So during that period where they're in the lodge together, they were both treasurer. Wow. And Frydenberg didn't know it. I oh my goodness. Like at least I, according to Josh, he didn't know it, and he's got no reason to lie or protect Scott Morrison today. So you oh, know. Oh no, no. And and from what I've read in, in the newspaper coverage of the people who've been speaking to Josh. He genuinely didn't know, and he is reportedly he's livid. Happy. He's not happy. No. Yes. And very much not happy. Look, I do find it very difficult to feel for Josh Frydenberg. Sure. But you do have to kind of feel for the guy because he was approached at the end of last year mm-hmm. by his colleagues to have a crack at rolling Scott Morrison prior to the election to try and save the furniture. Yes. And he chose to be loyal to Scott Morrison. Yes. And then he finds out. Two months after the election, when he lost his own seat, in large part because of Scott Morrison, uh-huh. that this has happened. Livid is quite a restrained term for how yeah. I would be feeling. Yeah. If I- <laughs> it's, it, it, it really is remarkable. So all of that, like that, that behaviour is, is, is really quite startling. Right. Um, the, the the questions that it raises around who was actually making decisions is another quite interesting one. And and someone made the comment earlier, just earlier this afternoon, that there was a period there. If you remember, uh, at some point last year, and I don't recall the date, but I think it would have been in November ish, there was a five hundred thousand dollar payout to uh, former staffer of Alan Touch, uh, Rachel Miller, and the the exact nature of the payout was not disclosed, and and the amount, you know, like all, all of this, there, there were some questions around it. People were trying to get Rachel Miller to disclose it, but it wasn't her place to do it. Although she gave permission for it to happen, it didn't happen. But the question was asked of Scott Morrison what the payment was for and what the incident was. Was it the incidents that were related to Alan Touch? And he said, that is a decision for the minister. Oh, Oh, my God. And he was joint minister at the time. Because oh, Morrison, he has been a master of not, not, not just the baffling word salad that we, we all, that you know, yes. everyone who, who watched his press conference yesterday. We'll had, come to that. We'll come had, to that. <laughs> had, um, had, I think, had, had sort of traumatic flashbacks to his prime ministership. But he's, he really was a master of saying one thing that on the surface sounded perfectly reasonable and then when he gave it a moment's thought made no freaking sense and that like now that we know what we know yeah everything he has said over the last two years is is questionable about which minister it was making that decision so i i i i think and i and i hope that somewhere in australian journalism and in australian political journalism there is at least somebody beavering away at question time for mm. the last 18 months at or at least those 15 months at all press conferences at which he asked or, or, or answered questions, any statements that he made, but any reference to that's a decision for the minister or that's a matter for the minister in response to a question implying that, look, I, I had nothing to do with it and I don't know, I think mm. needs to be brought out and, and asked about. And I also want to see the signature on every single ministerial decision that was made in those portfolios over that period. Because yeah. I'm 
were they really all by that minister or were some slid through? I don't believe this is the end of it. And I also don't believe that those four administrative orders, and there are only four because two of them were done in, in one order, I find it a little hard to believe that that was the end of it. Mm. I just find it a little hard to believe that that was the end of it, that there, we, we're not going to learn as, as things heated up with China, we're not going to learn that actually he signed himself in as defence minister as well or as, you know, like who knows. Um, well, during the, you know, like as the cricket season heated up, he signed himself in as, as sport minister. Well, I mean, you know, because um, Peter Dutton happened to be defence minister at the time that everything was heating up with China and yes. he's been asked point blank, did he think that Morrison never signed himself in as defence minister? And he said he didn't He didn't think so. He wasn't aware. <laughs> but he, he doesn't know. This is the, this is the really know? crazy thing. How like, would you know? How would you know? Exactly. Yeah. So things like Barnaby Joyce found out after the fact, apparently, and, and it sounds like if we sort of believe and take at face value the stories that are being told, he only found out after Keith Pitt was overruled on the exploration licence. So Keith Pitt went back to the National Party, went to um, Barnaby Joyce, who was leader at the time, and went, what the hell's going on here? Morrison's just said that he's going to make the decision and he's got the authority but he can't show me or won't show me the executive order or the administrative order that gives him authority. And oh Barnaby's gone, God. what are you talking about? Like, this is this is news to me. How? I mean. So, the- and, <laughs> yes, I know. Like, where, where do I start with that? But the the orders exist. So here's, here's what would normally happen, you know, like if, if you're curious. Here's what would normally happen when a minister is signed in. and And ministers are signed in at short notice to take over from somebody else all the time. Mm. Um, And often it's somebody with lighter responsibilities in a ministerial sense. So it's, it's sometimes the prime minister or the deputy prime minister who otherwise don't have ministerial or portfolio responsibilities. Fair enough. I get sick. I can't take on my duties, you know, uh, I have cancer, I have a car accident, whatever it might be, maybe I'm travelling overseas on a holiday and I can't be the minister and they sign somebody in instead. Now, sometimes that will be my assistant minister, the deputy minister for whatever or somebody else uh, closely related and they sign this administrative order, I go away and I'm absent so I, I can't do anything during that period It's published in the Gazette, so the Commonwealth Gazette gets a copy of it. It's published. Everybody sees it, and at least anybody who chooses to look in the Commonwealth Mm. Gazette can see it. And sometimes there's a press conference about it, especially if it's the first time that someone's got portfolio responsibilities, right? right, right. That's what normally happens. Yeah, it's it's like taking none of that happened. Yeah, yeah. None of that happened. At least none of that happened publicly. Um, yeah. And it really raises some serious questions. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it's like taking on higher duties in, in, in your normal job. You know, your boss is away for, for a month or whatever. Yeah. And someone steps up to sign his, you know, their, I should say their approvals yeah. or, you know, yeah. approve people's annual leave or raise CapExes or whatever it is that they need to do because that rog needs to continue to function. Can't stop, right? Yeah. In the absence of the primary person. This is not dramatic. No. You know? No, and and if your reason was we need to be in a position where we can make decisions quickly, that that sounds perfectly reasonable. Okay, like that that sounds perfectly reasonable. We're going to do it for three months until we see what happens. But you know, like it, it sounds perfectly reasonable. And given the shit that was going on at the beginning of the pandemic, mm. aside from some queries around what does that what does that mean in terms of actual authority. What if you disagree with each other, mm. for example, like in the Pip case, and, and I think the answer is whoever signs it first. But, <gasps> you know, like aside from questions like that, everyone else I think would have just gone, okay, well, that's, that sounds like a reasonable precaution. Mm. At least identify the people that you need and get them signed up. Fine. The idea that you would do that and not announce it to the public mm. starts to become questionable. Right? So why would you not allow the public to know something like that? And the answer was uh, we, we were concerned that people would panic. See, I, I, I call shenanigans on that. Yes. Because if, 
Here's a hypothetical for you, Steve. If, if you were Prime Minister okay. and, yeah, there was an outbreak of some new virus and, you know, people, and I will never forget the images from Italy of <laughs> the army trucks ferrying literally truckloads of 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 dead bodies to morgues. Yeah. So the early, you know, we have to, to, much as we're all relaxed about the pandemic now, we do have to remember those first few early months were terrifying. Yeah. And so if the Prime Minister had come out and said, it's okay, guys, We've put redundancies in place so mm. that if and when the virus reaches Australia and if it attacks the core of our government, if, if the health minister gets to, uh, in the course of, of his duties is infected and incapacitated or, or you know, mm. tragically um, dies from it, we have a redundant minister in place who can take over the second that, you know, seamless. That right. would have been reassuring. Wouldn't it? Yeah, and, and this notion that he didn't want people to panic, this is the guy who wanted to go to the footy one mm. last time before he put the country into lockdown. Mm. The notion that he was so concerned about those early panic-stricken days of the, of, of the pandemic did not contrast with his public response to the pandemic, to, no. to, put, it, to put it politely. I will also point out that at that same time, Peter Dutton had COVID. Yes! Remember? So we actually had a minister He because he, he went on an overseas trip, he came back, he, he contracted COVID, and he was home affairs, and, yes. and we know from later on in the pandemic that home affairs is serious enough that he signed himself up alongside Karen Andrews, but not when an actual minister was actually sick and we weren't sure at the time because we didn't have the vaccine, so we didn't really know whether his case was going to be one of those ones that after six or seven, seven days his health declined rapidly or whether or not mm. he would just, you know, meander through it and, and be okay. But if you were going to enact that kind of power, you'd think that would be the one that you would start with in your list. Do yeah. It, do it then, right? Do it then. Yeah, I mean he, had a lit he literally had a situation. The exact situation that yeah. he says he was trying to accommodate prepare Paul you know and he didn't do it as didn't, far as we're aware didn't do it yes it's, it's so freaking weird the other weird thing is that he never rescinded that order yeah. until they lost the election well yes and of course then he would have you know then he he lost all of his ministries all of them all five <laughs> plus the prime ministership that we know about uh, it oh and, and that's the thing like the more you dig into it the more the the brain worms have sort of attack you because it just yeah it doesn't make sense on any level yes so let's let's come back because speaking of not making sense on any level let's talk about the governor general who was presented with this plan and went okay that that sounds like a plan and to help you with that plan we won't publish these appointments in the commonwealth gazette now it's interesting in, in his statement, the Governor-General is very, very careful to talk about the fact that whether or not a ministerial appointment is publicised is a matter for the government of the day. Mm. Now, publicising something is very, very different from keeping a record of something. Oh, and the Commonwealth Gazette is the record. It's not the it's publicization. The record. Now, you publish it and you keep a record of everything. And if Scott Morrison wants to talk about it, yeah, sure, that's entirely up to him. But any journalist who cares to look, and there are many political journalists who keep an eye on the Gazette just to see what's happening, um, and I guarantee you the likes of Laura Tingle keeps an eye on it and, and that kind of thing, mm. they would have noticed that that appointment had been made and they might have asked some questions. They weren't published. None of them were. But the language, the choice of words was really interesting. Mm. The decision to publicise the appointment is a matter for the government of the day. That was, yeah, that's, that, that was the response. That's some epic weasel words. Ooh, yeah. And again, on the surface, sounds totally reasonable and a number of journalists have come out and said, leave the Governor-General alone basically. <laughs> And, and there is actually a heated debate underway over, over the role of the Governor-General in terms of, well, the 1975 dismissal is what happens when you have an activist Governor-General and we don't want that. Oh, couldn't, no. 
But at so, the same time, but the, the, the counter argument is, and then Mike, I think um, Michael Pasco mm. wrote, a, wrote an article about this along the lines of, well, what's the point of having a heavily, you know, a highly remunerated and an expensive ceremonial role of the Governor General? We might as well just issue the government a rubber stamp yeah. because it would have the same effect. And Jenny Hocking wrote a lovely piece in the, well, not lovely, because there's nothing about the situation is lovely. No, not really. But Jenny Hocking wrote a piece in The Guardian today basically calling bullshit, as, mm. as you just did, mm. on the wording in that, that governor's, Governor General statement. And I think she, I feel like she threads the needle really well between those two arguments of we cannot have another drawn curve versus we might as well have a rubber stamp. Because the Governor General does have responsibilities. Yes. And he has he Governor General does have wiggle room. So there is this sort of yes. perception that he has to take the advice of the Prime Minister. Sure, but not blindly. Not blindly. He's allowed to question. Yes. And if he and and also if he felt that the Prime Minister was asking him to do something unconstitutional, he has the right to resign. Yeah. Because that yeah. is a a protest that would be felt you know, literally across the globe. Yeah. Because the person he resigns to is Queen Elizabeth. Is the Queen. And 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 that has a tendency to raise some questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That that that's an attention getter. Instead, he stayed quiet, mm. didn't publicize this, did take the opportunity to chat with Scott Morrison in March to see whether or not the federal budget might have some money for a leadership school that he had in the wings and and subsequently was awarded $18 million over five years of federal money to a school that at the time didn't exist. But he's patron of. Mm. I, again, like you have to question whether or not there's some quid pro quo going on there. I was, you know, like... If this were a, a, a mafia movie, we'd, we'd say he called in a marker, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I have to stress that we're not suggesting for a second that the Governor-General has done anything corrupt or underhand or in any way um, defaming him, just to be clear. But absolutely not. It's, the optics don't look good. Well, well said, yes. The optics do not look good. So I do think that the Governor-General's position is untenable. The current government, the Albanese government, has been very, very careful to sort of sure. tiptoe around the issue of the Governor General. But I think sure. as this story progresses, I, th I think the governor's, uh, Governor General's position will become increasingly untenable. Yeah. And Albanese will have no choice but to sack him. Yeah, or, or, or give him the opportunity to resign, you know, yeah. citing, citing family reasons or health or a desire to ski the ups more frequently or something. <laughs> The surprising one for me. So Scott Morrison came out on Monday morning or Tuesday morning. This this week's been a little bit of a blur around this topic, but he appeared on Ben Fordham's show and, and had a bit of a softball interview. But even Ben didn't sound convinced, I have mm. to say. Yeah, like and like even his even his normal BFFs in the media, now that he's no longer Prime Minister. Mm. Actually, seem to be putting their journalistic hats back on. It's 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 quite extraordinary to hear. And what was wild about that Ben Fordham interview is that Fordham asked him very specifically: Were there any other portfolios that you you signed yourself into? Prices. And Morrison said, "Oh, none that I recall." None and then that literally I recall. Minutes later, <laughs> none that I recall. It's a beautiful answer. Yes. None that I recall. And then, yeah, literally minutes later, we find out that he signed himself into resources, into home affairs, and into the treasury. Yeah, and in, in 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 fairness, though, there's probably been a bunch of people who were treasurer who didn't realise it at the time, or it slipped their mind <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. yeah, I had to I mean, check, and apparently, I've not been treasurer. I'm sure but, they came. You know, as like I did, I, I did check just to make sure because it is a, it is one that you uh, slips your mind apparently. So. Yes. Yeah. Look, you know, if you're not careful, you end up with all these extra responsibilities and apparently mm -hmm. without getting paid for them. I mean, who wants to do that? I mean, this is, this is the era of the, the quiet resignation where people rock up to work and do the bare minimum. Do the bare minimum. Why yes, would they indeed. take on extra responsibilities? <laughs> yes. yes, indeed. But it, it also shows that, you know, Scott Morrison was bad at a lot more jobs than we thought. 
Oh, my God, yes, because it puts the whole that's not my job thing into a whole different perspective now. Because and 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 something I I actually got quite angry. I I, I know I realized that I've spent this entire podcast just WTFing at you, but one thing that really got up my nose was Morrison trying to justify all of this by going, well, everybody thought that I was responsible for everything, you know, every drop of rain, every new COVID strain that came out, and they wanted me to act. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, but dude, not not literally. What we wanted was for for your government to to govern yeah. and, you know, roll out vaccines and make rapid antigen tests available in, a, in an efficient and, and equitable fashion. We didn't Not, want you personally to go and vaccinate 20 million people. Yeah. That's dumb. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it really was. It was a remarkable take. And then later he came and said, look, I'm, I'm sorry to my colleagues for not telling them, um, I, you know, I had the utmost respect for them and I had the utmost faith in their ability to do their jobs, blah, 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 but I didn't tell them that I was taking on their responsibilities alongside them just in case they did the wrong thing. But he's yet to he's yet to acknowledge any kind of wrongdoing to the Australian people. Oh, yeah. And, you know, to, to go back to his colleagues, hmm. It was literally an apology if he had caused them offence yeah, by yeah, yeah. secretly yeah. undermining their positions. Yeah. Because, and this did is that, the, and it, Did that bother you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that bothered you. I'm not yeah. sorry I did it. I'm just no. sorry that that, I'm, I'm, that made I'm you sorry feel that, bad. That, yeah, I'm sorry that you feel bad about it. And look, Karen Andrews is not my favourite person, but good on her for absolutely tossing her toys out of the crop and demanding yeah. that he resign because that is a yep. rational and I think realistic response to, to yeah. all of this. What do you think his chances, what do you think his chances are of seeing out or actually I don't I don't think he's going to stay this term anyway and he seems mm-hmm. to have given plenty of indication that he's going to resign and cause a, a by election at some point anyway. It, it's just a, a matter of time. But do you think this will play into that timing? Well it's Yes and no, mm-hmm. in that the, the speculation has been that he's literally just cooling his heels on the back bench until he finds a well-paid job outside of politics. So board positions, speaking circuit, yeah. a lot of people have speculated that he will, you know, embrace religion even more fervently. I mean, look, Hillsong needs a new chief pastor. True, you know, true, putting it out there. true, yeah, yeah, yeah. But... What 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 this episode has done, I think, has has severely damaged his credibility, and therefore mm-hmm. his his chances of actually finding well remunerated board positions yeah. in the corporate sector. Because and I, I went through, look, I I went through Twitter and <clears throat> collected far too many, you know, incredibly witty and enjoyable takes on this. But I, I am going to share several of them with you, so you have to be with Thank me. Thank you. But, there was a brilliant one from Samantha Maiden. When former PM goes for those big job interviews for board positions, I will pay actual cash to be in the room for the how do you approach governance issues segment. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, nice. Sam, nice. well done. That's, yes, yeah. no, that, is, that is good. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yep. And she's right. Right, <laughs> because no. yeah, his his entire prime ministership was a masterclass in not just dodging responsibility, which is one of the many reasons why mm. we tossed his government out in May. Mm. Mm. But it was a it was absolute hostility to transparency, scrutiny, uh, accountability, and a demonstration that he did not understand the what the word integrity meant. Never mind had any of it. And so when, you, when you're looking for someone with the cachet of being a former prime minister of a country to, you know, put on your board or to make the patron of whatever it is that's going on, you kind of no. at this stage even Tony Abbott is a, is a much more attractive former PM than Mo- Scott Morrison. Which is, which is saying something. Which is wild. Which is a, saying something, yeah. yeah. And I think, I, you know, uh, Tony Abbott, while he was Prime Minister, appointed himself uh, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs 
and Minister for Women, two portfolios for which he is uh, vastly underqualified, let alone being Prime Minister. But, you know, like if you're going to pick something for him to take on in addition to being Prime Minister, Mm. those would be some of the last things that I would choose for him. Yes. At least he did it publicly and just the two and solo, like he he picked them for himself kind of thing rather than secretly appointing it. Yeah. I'm kind of glad that it didn't occur to uh, Tony Abbott to do this because. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, at the time, w- you know, women and, and I think First Nations people across the country quite accurately and justifiably accused Tony Abbott of trolling them by taking on those portfolios. Sure. But as you said, at least he did it openly and yeah. transparently yeah. and was yeah. the only minister. Yeah. Uh, for women. Um, yep. I have another tweet. This is, yes. this is from The Shovel. Who are oh, okay. yes. in this in this yeah, the on last fire week, this week absolutely yep. on fire. They are rapidly approaching national treasure status. It says a lot about our country that a man who ate a raw onion, knighted a prince, threatened a shirt front the leader of Russia, called Canada Canadia, and said scrapping the carbon tax was his biggest achievement as Minister for Women mm. is not our weirdest former Prime Minister. <laughs> it's it really is remarkable. And I and I have to agree. It's yeah. not like that that part I think was just straight reporting. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The shovel is now a serious news outlet, people. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So so to come back, come back to the question that you asked me, which is, do I think this episode is going to speed up or delay yep. his departure from Parliament? Yeah. I suspect it's actually going to delay it because yeah, the reason he he's hanging around jobs. is he's got nowhere else to go. And there have been calls for him not just to resign. I mean that that's standard. But also there have been calls for Dutton to expel him from the Liberal Party mm. and there have been calls for him to – we can't actually kick MP out of Parliament. No, um, no, no, no. There, there is mean, no we, sort of – Yeah, and we learned that lesson the hard way with George Christensen, I think. Yeah, and, and Craig Thompson before him. Yeah, true. So, yeah, the, the only way that Morrison – leaves Parliament in the next three years is, is if he resigns. Yeah. And, there, look, there is a very good argument that he should stay and deal with the consequences, like be censured, but it's, yeah, it's wild. I, I think I, I never ever imagined that I would ever say this, but if I was in Peter Dutton's shoes, <laughs> I would actually be very, very tempted. I would, I would be considering my options around kicking I'd be Morrison wearing fresh socks, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if I was Peter Dutton as opposition leader and the current leader of the Liberal Party, mm. I would expelling Morrison from the Liberal Party would be a yeah. live option for me. So one of the interesting things that came up yesterday, so Wednesday this week, came from Senator McKenzie, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the senator in a moment for another reason, but Senator McKenzie came out and said, I see what Morrison was doing as a breach of our coalition agreement. Wow. Because there are a certain number of ministries and we have essentially a power sharing arrangement in the cabinet that says we have so many, you have so many between the Liberals and the National Party. That argument um, and that line of argument could easily be used as leverage to get Morrison kicked out of the party, I think. Get rid of him or lose the coalition. Yes. And, and in the current parliament, the National Party actually have quite a quite a, a, a deal of power within the coalition, more so than they have in the past. But I find that one interesting. I haven't seen the response from David Littleproud to that line of argument, but I, I did find it interesting that that might be a point of leverage that they can use to get rid of him if they chose. That is fascinating. And and actually it brings to mind a thread that I forgot to tug on a bit earlier, mm. which was uh, when, when Keith Pitt was overridden by Morrison and he went mm. to Barnaby Joyce and went, dude, mm. what the fuck? Yeah. And, and Joyce went, I got, well, like, this is news to me. How did it not become public then? What, yeah, what happened at that point? Why, 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 why? Yeah, because not to be presumptuous, but if, if we as the Democrats were in coalition with another party and they pulled that kind of bullshit on us, I, yeah, we'd, I we'd say you know, something. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, I, I mean, what, what, what he's doing now and what they're all saying now is we believe that what he was doing was unethical and wrong. 
And if that's your view now, then why would you not speak up then? Yeah, the second you found out about it. Yeah, you know, like that, that again, feels like a little bit of a no-brainer. Yeah, um, I mean, and let's, let's keep in mind that Barnaby Joyce was literally the Deputy Prime Minister. That's right. Right, he he wasn't he was not he was not a man of of in of insignificant power. Yeah, absolutely. At that stage, he yeah. could have brought the government. Like if the coalition had had fallen apart at that moment, like if Barnaby had sort of stormed into Scott's office and went, "That's it, we're done. I'm I'm, I'm tearing up our coalition agreement because of this horrendous betrayal." The government would have fallen. And granted, I I am assigning a level of integrity to Barnaby Joyce that he has show no evidence of ever holding sure but you'd like i'd like yeah. so let me ask you a question was <laughs> that was that a bargaining chip that was put on the table three months later when they were negotiating ahead of the glasgow summit <gasps> oh see this is the, the rabbit here's, hole just gets deeper here's here's what we want 30 billion dollars in regional infrastructure spending here's what we want or I'm going to the media now and disclosing this crap that you've been pulling because it was still in effect. So we, we're talking April, May, the negotiations around net zero and the target that we were taking to Glasgow and what the Nationals wanted was only three months later, four months later. Shit. I mean, yes, Morrison had to go to Glasgow and have something. I mean, he, he was a pariah at Glasgow anyway. Anyway. Yes. But he produced this fig leaf of a yes. thingy. Yes. And $30 billion seemed a lot of money for something that Morrison, we knew Morrison didn't believe in. Yeah, yeah. Speaking Far of, out. Speaking of Twitter, and just to sort of take the, the attention away, I saw a thing on Twitter earlier today, people looking at some of those photos of Scott Morrison, you know, um, the, the photos of him amongst world leaders. There's a group of world leaders over there and a group of world leaders over there. And it turns out that that was actually a group shot of Morrison in the middle. It was half the cabinet, you know. <laughs> I But I, I find that idea that the reason nothing happened is that uh, Joyce simply sat on it until he could use it a few months later in those negotiations, kind of compelling. Yes, absolutely. And particularly because Joyce has since come out and basically said there's nothing to see here move along people. Like he he has not joined the chorus of people going, this is an outrage. He's at, he's one of the people who have come out and defended Morrison. Yeah. So, it, yeah, yeah, like. I got what I wanted and now, yeah, yeah it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. We will see. My money is that the next the next press conference Scott Morrison gives will be to resign. If he fronts the media at all, it will be to tender his resignation. I don't think he'll do another one like yesterday where he bothers to answer questions. Oh, um, God, no. You know, um, he'll he'll claim stress on his family or wanting to spend more time with the girls or whatever it, whatever it, it might be. Yeah. Oh, he'll um, 100% blame the, the media and the Australian public for this hmm. intolerable situation that has erupted and now he can no longer serve as the member for Cook and blah, 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 and how dare you. Yeah. And I also don't think that he will bother to front a media a, a press conference to, to you say don't think it either. So? No. No. Okay. I, mm. I found it very odd that he had a press conference for an hour. Yeah, true. You know, that's weird. Normally that's he's not you like know, him. That's not like him. <laughs> it was so, really weird. So before we before we wrap up and 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 we are, it feels like we're 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 getting to time. But I, I did just want to come back to this question around the journalists who wrote the book. Yes. So in his press conference yesterday, Scott Morrison made mention of the fact that these uh, actions of his were disclosed at the time to the journalists as part of interviews that they were doing for the book. Yes. Right? So they were, you know, hey, we're going to write a book about what's going on in Australian politics, behind the scenes look at, you know, how we handled the, the pandemic. We want to do some interviews with you. And in at least one of those interviews, he said to them, oh, and so I made myself joint health minister uh, and joint finance minister, right? They told these two journalists at the time. And I will just mention, because I did say I'd come back to it, one of those journalists is the partner of Senator Bridget McKenzie. So, Which is... Just, that's just one of those things, wild. right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, in in a, in a story of much wildness, that's 
one of the weirdly one of the less least interesting aspects of all yes. this, and and yet it should be uh, an, an outrage. But still, yeah. So you've got these two journalists who are political reporters. It's not like they're writing the science pages. They're political journalists and senior political journalists at that. They must have been aware of the severity of what they were hearing, and they chose to keep it to themselves until now in order to promote their book. Yeah. And Daniel Bleakley of Miners and Tesla's fame. Yes. He says, while Anthony Albany was getting roasted for not knowing the unemployment rate, the Australian political journalist knew about Morrison's secret ministerial appointments but kept it from the public. What's their job? Yeah. Like what are they actually there for? Uh, Is it cheerleading? Is it, you know, trying to... um, sway public opinion towards one party and away from another because that appears to be what they're doing. And when they sit on information like this and choose not to disclose it, not Mm. to write about it, that's remarkable and really concerning, I think, or at least I think it should be really concerning to people. Yeah. And and what it shows that there's kind of sort of one – one of two sort of explanations for this, and neither of them are terribly flattering to these journalists. One is, is as you said, they knew this was explosive. They knew that it was bordering on being a constitutional crisis. Mm-hmm. Morrison told them about it because he thought it would make him look good. Because they were writing about his management of the pandemic, mm-hmm. he felt this was necessary information to frame him in this heroic light, right? Yes, and they chose, knowing how explosive this was, sat on it until they could use it in the publicity for their book. And, you know, Morrison appears to have quite cheerfully thrown them under the bus on that issue. So any loyalty that they have demonstrated to him, he has not not reciprocated. Never, yes. Which, again, is very on brand for Morrison. It's very on brand, yep. So there's that, right? And mm-hmm. that is, I think, the, the more likely of the two scenarios. The yeah. other scenario is that these two very senior, very experienced political editors didn't grasp what it was, like didn't grasp mm. the significance of this and were possibly possibly saw it through the same lens that Morrison did, which is, look how heroic this man has been. He's taken on all this extra work to shepherd and shepherd the country through a pandemic and save us all. Mm. And that they saved it for the publicity for their book in order to frame Morrison in that light. Yeah, yeah. Which shows that they're Shockingly either, naive at least. You know? Yes, yes, that, and that's very generous. They're, they're either shockingly naive, shockingly stupid, and or... They've forgotten what it is, what their job is, which is to be journalists mm. and and not cheerleaders for a liberal prime minister. It's yeah, yeah. It 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 was it was remarkable, and it's been interesting again to see the reaction from other segments of of the media. Um, mm. It's been interesting to see the reaction from other politicians. I have to say. No one has yet asked Bridget McKenzie whether or not she was aware at the time. Did her partner, who who had had this information disclosed to him, mention it to her at the time? Is a reasonable question, I think, to ask. Another yeah. question that I, th- I think needs to be asked is: is is that all of them? Yeah. Like was that was that it? Because um, you know Scott Scott is struggling to remember all of the ministries that he took over. Yeah, if he can't recall. Yeah, exactly. If he can't remember, how are we supposed to work it out? But the information that was given felt oddly specific. So the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet came back and said between March 2020 and May 2021, Scott Morrison did the following. Mm. Okay, what about after May 2021? Like the the follow-on to that sentence and there was subsequently no further appointments made, would give me a great deal of comfort. And the fact that it's not there and raises questions for me. It, huge questions. And and the, the reason why I think this story is so shocking to, you know, to everybody that hears it, first of all, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll finish kicking the media mm. while, <laughs> yeah. while we're at it before we move yep. on to the next problem. And and this is the thing, right, so the, the, the Twitterati get mm. lambasted regularly by the media for, well, I mean, from the, twi- you know, the, the perspective of people who are on Twitter, which includes you and I, mm-hmm. uh, is for doing their job for them. 
Yes. And holding them to <laughs> holding yes. not just them but also our politicians to account. Yes. But you know the media don't react well to scrutiny to, to scrutiny of their own. No. And and I, I sort of sort of watching this unfold, I'm like, and and yet you you wonder why this is like you have people like Simon Benson sitting on shit like this. Mm. Like this is this had the potential to be the biggest constitutional crisis since 1975. And still might become so. And still might yes. become it, yes. You know, it's not you know, over. Think, yep. things might change after the recording. And the media sort of sit back and go, why are the people on Twitter so mean to us? Yes. And I think it was, oh, who was the dude who does the essential polling for Guardian? Peter Lewis. And I'm quoting, quoting I, oh, I forget who I'm quoting here, but Peter Lewis apparently said after the uh, it might have been after the, the 2022 election that after the 2019 election, he, uh, his team and all the other polling companies took stock of, of their failures in the 2019 election and, and how badly they got the 2019 election wrong. Okay. And they did a root and branch review and they changed their methodologies and they looked very, very hard at how they did their jobs okay. and they held themselves to account and they changed. And it was reflected in the fact that in the 2022 election, the polls were actually considerably more accurate than they were in 2019. Yeah. And Peter Lewis's thing in, in particular is interesting because the essential poll has dropped the two-party preferred polling. They will, you know. Not do that anymore. Hmm. No, they won't do that anymore. So they, they're no longer correcting for two-party preferred. They'll mm-hmm. have the level of support for the coalition, level of support for the Labor Party, level of support for Greens. And if people come back and go, I don't actually know who I'd vote for at this moment in time, they say so. Hmm. So there's that. Okay. And he said, why is it that the media, who arguably have gotten more wrong over a longer period than the polling yep. companies did, why have they not gone through this process? And I, basically, when will they? When when will it dawn on them that they need to have a long, hard look at themselves and how they operate? And I feel like this is a perfect encapsulation of what Peter Lewis is getting at when he had a crack at the media. I... I think P. Lewis is making the mistake of thinking that those journalists are judged on the basis of their journalism rather than on the basis of their revenue that they generate for their newspaper or media company. Um, and, And they won't learn that lesson because from their perspective, they are being successful. And from Mm. the perspective of their employers, they are being successful. And from the perspective of this book that they've gotten all of this publicity for over the last 10 days as a result of this particular incident will also be deemed a success. So they won't actually learn the lesson. It will reinforce the behaviour, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. They're they're effectively an entertainment industry rather than a, a, a news industry these days. Mm. Well, the Some original more business- so than others, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, the original business model of the newspapers was, you know, they were ad um, uh, channels and the journalism was simply the wrapping around the ads. And, of course, mm-hmm. when the classifieds uh, were basically hijacked by Google and Facebook and, and other online entities, mm-hmm. uh, it killed their business model. And so, yeah, they've, they've moved into the entertainment and, and clickbait sort of Out- arena. Basically, outrage entertainment. Mm. And so look, they're I, succeeding I, wildly. Yeah, they are. They, and and this, is, <laughs> this is my point. I, I, I don't think they will learn. I, I don't think the likes of Andrew Bolt or Chris mm. Kenny or Peter Credlin or Simon Benson are going to wake up tomorrow and go, geez, I've drifted a long way away from the journalism I aspired to as a child. What have I done with my life? They're going to look instead at their bank balance and go, mm, I seem to be doing okay. Yeah. Because it's it's the thing that they seem to care more about. Yeah. So Sarah Martin from the government, uh, the government, <laughs> the Guardian, yep. has also been on fire this week covering mm-hmm. this. Catherine Murphy has taken a leave of absence to write a quarterly essay about uh, Anthony Albanese. Damn. And she okay. must be kicking herself. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I can't wait for this weekend's Saturday paper. Oh, yes. I just I can't wait for it. I don't know who's going to get this story to to write. I, I suspect someone like Karen Middleton. I am ready for that one. I'm going to be out of bed like a kid at Easter, uh, hunting down chocolates for that one. That that was going to be well worth it. 
Oh, yes. Yeah. And again, as, as you said, I think it's something that's going to run for a while. So we might get the full st- Saturday paper stable across it. So, yeah, maybe. You know, maybe. We, we, I know, like um, Rachel Withers was on it the other day oh. on uh, Monday or Tuesday, I think, and, and that was well worth listening to and, and, and reading. I, I just can't wait for what the others come up with. Yes. Whoever's been doing headlines for the monthly is also <laughs> on. Like, it's, it's really interesting how so many elements of, of the media have absolutely just soared on the, off the back yep. of this. So The Shovel, yep. now a serious media outlet. Yep. The likes of Rachel Withers, Sarah Martin, Karen Middleton, I think, will be in fierce form on Saturday, as you predicted. I think so. yep. But I think it was yesterday's, not the briefing, the politics that the Rachel Withers yeah. writes. Um, yep. First of all, Rachel also on fire. Yes. But her, her headline dude in reporting Scott Morrison's pref conference just put, the eagle has ranted. <laughs> Brilliant. Nice. Because apart from being a riff, and 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 I'm sorry to to uh, politics explain this to people, but apart from being a riff on the whole, you know, the eagle has landed thing from the Apollo landing, mm. the, it 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 it's this beautiful connection back to the eagle painting that Morrison claims inspired, you know, gave him sort of inspiration and strength to continue in in his darkest hour on the campaign trail in the 2019 election, and convinced him that um, God wanted him to be the prime minister. So it was just. The meta-ness of it all, just brilliant. So the reason why all this matters, for those listeners who are still with us, thank you. It, it's, it's, it's been a big one. It, it's what it's revealed, and, and I, I alluded to this in the beginning, is that everyone's latched onto the secrecy as if that's the problem. Hmm. And it's actually not. What this whole episode has revealed is we have talked in the past about how fragile our democracy is, but we've seen revealed to us exactly how fragile this is. How fragile, how much are our core institutions that that literally govern the nation are held together not through law, not through the constitution, but by tradition and um, covenant and what's the other word? Um, norms. Norms, thank you, yes. And they can be subverted and hmm. like they are loopholes that you can drive a, a track through as Scott Morrison did. Yes. And this is something I think also the US is going through as well, where because you know, when, when Donald Trump first ran for the presidency, everyone just thought this was a gigantic joke and a novelty and how ridiculous and everything else, and then he became president. Hmm. And he may well become president again if he runs in 2024, if, if, if his own particular legal troubles don't catch up with him. But I've always maintained that Donald Trump is not the problem. No. And Donald Trump isn't like he, Donald Trump is a dangerous megalomaniac, but he's not the the terrible threat that might undo the American, the, the United States. It's the next one that comes along who is smarter and more cunning hmm. and potentially more charismatic hmm. than Donald Trump and yeah. who does in secret all the stuff that Donald Trump did in the open because Trump's overriding fixation was to be was was the applause and 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 to be told how awesome he was and and to be seen to be wielding power, not just to wield it. Hmm. The per- the most dangerous person is going to be the Donald Trump who is happy to wield power in the shadows and who happens to be good at it. And I feel like we have dodged a similar bullet with Morrison hmm. in that Morrison's inherent laziness. I think <laughs> the fact that he like you know his mantra was, well, "I don't hold a hold a hose," and that's not my job. You know, ha- having grasp power, he was happy to just to, to just grasp it and not actually wield it. Yep. Unless it was in in pursuit of a political problem like the Pep Eleven thingy, where he did actually use the powers. And then mm. this is the other thing, like his whole thing of, oh, well, I never actually used all these powers that I grabbed up, so it's okay. You know, no crisis. I, I took all these powers unto myself, you know, in secret and unbeknownst to the people who who were, yeah. you know, were originally signed in to use them. But it's okay because I didn't use them. And what this has revealed, and 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 what we as a nation need to fix, hmm. is the fact that the next one who comes along, who mostly is not as dumb as Scott Morrison, is willing to pull these powers to themselves in secret, in the shadows, and then wield those powers. This is how democracies fall. And and I, I realize I sound dramatic when I say that, but But it's true. It is true. Because this this is the slippery slope down to authoritarianism. Yeah. And Conchetta you, Fiaventi, well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Conchetta Fiaventi Wells warned us hmm. when she dunked on Morrison uh, on budget night. There's a long history of 
dictators and authoritarian leaders putting forward silhouettes or sock puppets basically as you know the the front of power the mm. you know the apparent wielders of power while they actually make all the decisions behind the scenes it's yeah. how oligarchies run you know like it's and it's essentially how russia runs putin doesn't seem or appear to hold all the power and have all the money but mm. it's all his you know, yeah. like all of those decisions are being made through him and all of that wealth and, and influence and power resides with him. It's the same road. Mm. It is the same road. And as much as that might sound like hyperbole, it is the same road. Scott Morrison shuffled his cabinet twice during this period and retained his ministries, those shadow, you know, those joint ministries right through. So he's shuffling other people in and out of roles. Matthias Corman left, Simon Birmingham came in. Simon Birmingham was unaware that Scott Morrison was also joint finance minister. Scott Morrison didn't give up his role now that Simon was there. He kept it and he didn't say anything about it. Like that kind of thing suggests something sinister and certainly hints at the potential for something very sinister in the way in which we we operate and and the the quality of our democracy. But you you mentioned before we rely on conventions and norms and we rely on a group of people who see those things as worthy in themselves of being upheld yeah. um, and something that should not be counted. Yeah. And in Scott Morrison at least, and in obviously in some of the people around him, because he was getting advice and he was being enabled by others, that group at least were willing to throw those norms out and in doing so, erode the quality of Australia's democracy. And it's not just members in his in his government. No. It was literally the head of state. Yes. And, you know, I don't want to and, accuse and the Governor a, General. And a protective media. You know. Yeah, yeah. Protective media, a protective fourth state, the head of state, whether or not the Governor General understood. And again, I, I, I don't want to accuse the Governor General of con, of conspiracy, but mm-hmm. it doesn't look great. His position, you know, doesn't doesn't look awesome. But it was also the public service. So Phil Gaitchens, who was the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet, like the primary yeah. department in the in the public service, was apparently in on this. And, and this is the thing, like a sinister person, like a smart Donald Trump or a smart Scott Morrison, can't actually do this shit on their own. This is literally why we have 20 or 30 ministries in government because it's not just that the workload is impossible for one person to, to do, hmm. it's so accountability and responsibility gets spread across a number of people. Hmm. And so, yeah, you might have a really shit defence minister, but you might have a kick-ass, you know, arts and science and and climate minister yep. and the country functions. And so th- this is why these sort of things, there are always cabals behind these sort of things. People... Hmm. It has to be a conspiracy at the end of the day in order for this to happen. And and what we're seeing is the unravelling of a conspiracy at the heart of our government amongst public servants, amongst members of the government, amongst members of, of Morrison's yeah. party mm-hmm. and the media. And I, I, I think we all have every right to be concerned by that. Yeah, it is. it falls now to the Albanese government mm. to, to deal with this. And... I've got a feel for Anthony Albanese because he, as we said in our last podcast, he has hit the ground running and and, and done really, really well. In spite of the fact that, as as Daniel Blakely said in his email, um, not email, uh, in his tweet, mm. Albanese's fitness for office was literally being questioned because he could not remember a bullshit statistic, and yet this was this was going on. I wouldn't say being covered up, but this was known about, and nobody bothered to mention it prior to the election. I think when when something occurs that should we publish, should be recorded, should normally be announced and none of those things happen, then covering them up is a reasonable summation. There's multiple levels of transparency failed and that's unacceptable. Yeah. It will be interesting to see how Anthony Albanese responds, how Mm -hmm. the Attorney-General responds, how various others 
in the National and Liberal Party's respond. Uh, ultimately, it will be interesting to see what Scott Morrison does, but I don't really expect him to do the right thing. I expect him to get pushed and, you know, like it to be made clear to him that his position is untenable, etc. But I, I do, I agree with you. I do feel for the Albanese government in having once again to clean up a mess that was made by somebody else when there's plenty of other things that need to be dealt with. To have yeah. to deal with this on top of it, is, is unfortunate, but I, I do look forward to seeing how they how they handle it. Me too. And it, and it's unfortunate for them because how they handle it will reflect on them yes. and not on the Morrison government that caused this yeah. mess. If it were me, I'd, I'd set up a – if there's going to be a committee, I'd set up uh, a committee and put someone like Helen Haynes in charge of it, take the Labor Party out of it, you know, like put the crossbench in charge of it. Helen uh, Haynes has been championing a federal ICAC. She's got a clear eye on – probity issues and transparency issues and um, uh, issues of corruption and, and good governance put her in charge and go, look, it's it's not a, a political thing. We want to get this right. Can you do something? But, uh... Yeah, make, make it a constitutional thing. And I I think the idea of, not and not just Helen, like give her the entire crossbench. Pull all the community independents in charge of it. Because, and it's a very elegant solution that number one, it, it demonstrate Albanese's commitment to apolitical transparency, accountability, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the right thing to do. But second of all, it it keeps the, the crossbench uh, community independence really busy for a while, yeah. which would then free him up to, or free his government up to go and deal with the, the serious problems that his government would probably very much like to be dealing with without having to, you mm. know, sort of ride herd on the, on the independence sort of searching for relevance. And it gives them something very, very important and very, very crucial to the national psyche to do, mm-hmm. which will burnish their credentials no end and gives Albanese the halo of being of taking politics out of what is yeah. what may yet become a constitutional crisis. Yeah. Which, which would be good for everybody if he, if mm. he does manage to do that. It, as I say, it will be interesting to see. Um, I, I don't think we've heard the end of it. I don't think we've gotten to the bottom of it. I think there's still a few things left. As I say, there's another 12 months of the Morrison government that isn't covered by the disclosures from yesterday, and I, I don't believe for one second that that's, that's, that's the bottom of the barrel. No. I mean, you know, to bring US politics back into it, Trump spent 11 weeks plotting a coup after the 2020 election because he, he did not want to accept the results. God knows what the Morrison got up to in its final 12 months. This is – Jenny Hocking called for a Royal Commission into all of this. Fair enough. And, yes, calling for Royal Commissions sure. is, is – gets, you know, it gets trotted out all the time, but there's a reason for that. Yeah. And normal investigative journalism, normal sort of parliamentary committees and in, in investigations – don't have the ability to kick over rocks and and compel people to give evidence Mm. the way a Royal Commission does. And I think if we want to clean up our politics, you know, going into the the uh, the, the 2022 election, it really did feel like a turning point in terms of rejecting, and this is what gets me, the overt and open corruption. That we could see. (laughs) We could see. This is it. I agree with Jenny Hocking in that we do need a Royal Commission to find out exactly how corrupt these these people were. Yeah. Because a lot of people have said that everyone who was involved in this on whatever level needs to be held to account, and they are correct, which is why I think the Governor-General's position is untenable. I mean, the Governor-General may have acted in good faith and thought that he was carrying out his duties of taking the advice from the Prime Minister. He is still tainted by this, let me say. Yeah. I also think he needs to take responsibility for it. Mm. And part yeah. of taking that responsibility is stepping down. Yeah. As I say, time will tell. Indeed, yeah. Look, we might have a follow-up podcast to this as, as things unfold because I've it's it's a fast-moving story. But this has been fun. <laughs> it has part been one, awesome. Part one's been fun. Part one's been fun. Stay tuned for the sequel, people, because I'm sure it's coming. Yep. But, um, no, Steve, thank you for this. This has really helped me sort of try and grasp the sheer enormity of this, which, as, as people have observed throughout the podcast, took on, on, on new depths for me. So this, is, this has been illuminating. Always a cathartic experience. Elena, thank you. <laughs> a pleasure. So... Quite a bit has happened since we recorded this discussion. 
Today, the advice from the Solicitor General was released in which it was found that Scott Morrison fundamentally undermined principles of responsible government. Nothing he did was strictly illegal, which wasn't surprising. This was a hallmark of the way the Morrison government operated and justified its actions to the nation. No laws were broken, so everything is okay. It really shows the moral and ethical vacuum at the heart of both Morrison and his government that the question of illegality is the only benchmark that registers for him. We've also learned that Scott Morrison personally apologised to Matthias Cormann and Josh Frydenberg for usurping their portfolios without telling them, but did not apologise to Karen Andrews until publicly ordered to by opposition leader Peter Dutton. The two men get an apology and the woman doesn't. Very on brand for Morrison. We also learn that the heads of ASIO and ASIS, our domestic and international intelligence agencies, were also unaware that Morrison had been appointed their minister alongside Karen Andrews. Which leaves us wondering what risk to national security this generated. Apparently, both Barnaby Joyce and Michael McCormack in their respective periods as leaders of the National Party and Deputy Prime Ministers knew about this arrangement and said nothing. Joyce claims that he feared retribution if he had crossed Morrison when Morrison overrode Keith Pitt's decision in the resources portfolio and that the Nationals could have lost the additional ministerial position he had obtained for them. I mean, screw conventions and principles and democratic norms when money, power and privilege are threatened. In saying the quiet part out loud, Joyce has only confirmed the Nationals as the organised mob of grifters that they have long been accused of being, and confirmed how profoundly unworthy of government they are. The Liberal Party leadership and elders in Peter Dutton and John Howard are so far continuing to defend Morrison, mostly because they don't think a by-election in Cook will be in the Liberals' interests especially with Dom Perrottet's New South Wales Liberal government facing a state election in March next year. Again, self-interest wins out over protecting our democracy. This extraordinary series of events is looming as a genuine test for both the Labor and Liberal parties. As we said in the podcast, for Prime Minister Albanese's government, it's cleaning up the mess created by the Morrison government and ensuring that these norms cannot be trashed again. For Peter Dutton and the Liberal Party, how they deal with Morrison and the fallout from this will likely shape their future as a party of government. He was their leader, their last Prime Minister, he is wholly a creature of the Liberal Party, and his actions reflect on the party as a whole. I've been quite open about how not sad I would be if the Liberal Party never formed government again, but we do need a functional opposition. The outstanding work of our independent media outlets has continued. Karen Middleton was, as expected, exceptional in the Saturday paper on the weekend. Crikey has raised similar questions to Steve about the curiously convenient funding of the Governor-General's charity. And independent journalists and commentators, Ronnie Salt and John Birmingham, each gifted us with utterly blistering takes on the whole mess. And today, Anthony Clan from the Klaxon has dropped a bombshell story about the Commonwealth Ombudsman calling for a review of hundreds of appointments made by Prime Minister and Cabinet, including all of those by Scott Morrison, over concerns that key officials were illegally appointed to multiple jobs. That hasn't hit the mainstream media yet, but it does show how much there is still to be unearthed. I've linked to everything I could in the show notes. Happy reading. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn by searching for Australian Democrats and you can see what we stand for, what we value and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.